Back in 2018, Lockheed Martin filed a patent for something they call a plasma confinement system. A device small enough to fit inside the fuselage of an F-16 and capable of managing internal temperatures 10 times hotter than the center of the sun. This scalable device was designed to play a vital role in bringing nuclear fusion to the defense apparatus. But let's be honest, it could literally change the world. Let's dive into this. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. In the decades to come, nuclear fusion could not only change everything about the way the world fights wars, but it could literally change the way humanity approaches the concept of conflict itself. And in a world where conflict over our limited access to resources like fossil fuels is not a foreign concept at all, you may be surprised to learn that some of the most advanced and leading efforts to field this technology that could end many future wars before they begin are actually being funded within the shadowy confines of the Pentagon's black budget. And the truth is, that shouldn't be that surprising, because nuclear-powered aircraft are not at all a new concept. As soon as mankind realized that it could produce huge amounts of power by splitting the atom, efforts began to incorporate this new concept into just about everything, including airplanes. Using just a small bit of nuclear fuel could allow fighters, bombers, or reconnaissance aircraft to stay airborne pretty much indefinitely. But despite several efforts aimed at fielding just such an aircraft propulsion system, atom-splitting fission reactors simply offer more risk than reward when hurtling through the sky at 50,000 feet. Now, these early fission efforts did find useful homes and naval applications, with some of these programs leading to today's nuclear-powered submarines and aircraft carriers. But aviation efforts, like Project Pluto's nuclear-powered SLAM missile, or Convair's NB-36 nuclear-powered bomber, on the other hand, look a little crazy in hindsight. The SLAM missile could have flown for literally thousands of miles, dropping hydrogen bombs at targets and spewing radiation out the back all along the way, all while producing such an intense amount of noise that scientists and engineers working on the program believed the sound waves coming from the engine alone would kill anyone the missile passed over. The NB-36 was maybe less insane. This hybrid B-36 bomber would use traditional fuel propulsion to take off and land, and in fact it did fly a number of times using that conventional fuel with a nuclear reactor on board. But once airborne, that nuclear reactor would take over and allow it to fly pretty much indefinitely to serve as an ongoing and ever-present nuclear deterrent in an era when the U.S. really was keeping nuclear bombers in the air pretty much all the time. Of course, a crash or a mishap in a bomber carrying nuclear weapons could be a geopolitical nightmare, but a crash in a bomber carrying nuclear weapons powered by a nuclear reactor could be significantly worse, both geopolitically and environmentally. These days, there's only one nation left on the planet that thinks fielding a fission-powered nuclear propulsion system for aerial platforms is a good idea. And surprise, it's Russia, with their 9M730 Burevestnik, or Skyfall, missile. And despite all the hype this program got after Putin announced it back in 2018, largely thanks to the Kremlin's media hype machine, this missile really sort of just proves my point. Not only is this missile seemingly no closer to fruition today than it was four years ago, but its development has been so troubled that despite the Kremlin's policy of not disclosing failures, some of its failures have been so conspicuous that the world couldn't help but notice them anyway including a 2019 explosion that killed five scientists from the Russian Federal Nuclear Center that's believed to have been tied to this effort. So to every nation that doesn't think it's a good idea to invade Ukraine, it's clear that fission and aerial platforms just don't really seem to mix. 
But fusion could be another story altogether. Nuclear fusion really could be thought of as the opposite of the fission process that's leveraged by today's nuclear power plants and weapon systems. Both are physical processes that produce energy from atoms, but while fission produces massive amounts of energy by splitting a larger atom into two or more smaller ones, fusion joins two or more lighter atoms into a single larger one. The classic fission approach to power plants have seen a resurgence in public interest in recent years as a viable option for energy production to work alongside other environmentally friendly initiatives, and for good reason. While fission plants do produce radioactive waste that can remain dangerous for literally millions of years, I'm going to say literally again in this sentence, but it remains literally millions of times more efficient as a means of power production than chemical reaction-based approaches like burning coal or natural gas. Now, I may think that modern, land-based fission nuclear reactors don't deserve the fear they're often met with. But I do want to be clear that even the safest reactors do come with some degree of inherent risk. The fission process has to be actively managed or cooled in order to prevent a runaway reaction, at least in larger reactors. That runaway reaction can lead to a meltdown and environmental catastrophes, like the ones we've actually seen in both Chernobyl and Fukushima. And as beneficial as fission power may be to mankind, fusion is on a completely different level. There's no potential for meltdown, and while it does produce some radioactive waste, the half-life of that waste is just 12 years. Fusion is also expected to be three or even four times more efficient than fission, which, as a reminder, is millions of times more efficient than coal. Fusion reactors are powered by two hydrogen isotopes called deuterium and tritium, the former of which is incredibly common in seawater. In fact, according to the U.S. Department of Energy, the amount of deuterium found in a single gallon of seawater could produce about the same amount of energy as 300 gallons of gasoline. Tritium is admittedly tougher to get your hands on. It's exceedingly rare in nature, but it can actually be produced using a fusion reactor and enriched lithium, like the material in your phone battery. Now, scientists have been able to create fusion reactions in laboratory settings lots of times in the past, but the energy required to superheat the reactor's fuel to temperatures measured in the millions of degrees Celsius, as well as the means to contain this superheated plasma reaction, have been the problem. Now, I am not a nuclear scientist, and this is incredibly complicated technology, but to put it in maybe an unfair nutshell, the real problem with fusion power to date is that currently it still takes more power for us to get the fusion reaction going and then to sustain it than the fusion reactor produces, but we're making steady strides. Last year, the joint European Taurus fusion reactor set a new world record by producing 59 megajoules of sustained energy over five seconds. I'm going to quote their senior manager, Fernanda Ramini, from an interview she did with Newsweek just last month. The record is not only that we've produced fusion, measurable fusion, and we've produced about twice as much as we did in 1997, but we produced it over five seconds, so it's quite steady, it's quite long. It's as long as we can because the experiment really isn't designed to last much longer. The magnetic confinement systems used by most fusion reactors come in at least four forms, but the most common of which are tokamaks, which are based on a design pioneered by Soviet physicists Igor Tam and Andrei Sakharov back in the 1950s, and stellarators, which were first invented by Lyman Spitzer at Princeton back in 1951. Now, there are also inertial confinement systems, and in general, just way more to talk about when it comes to fusion. I'm sure there will be some really well-informed folks in the comments below, but just as a reminder, just like anything you hear from me, don't take anything at face value, throw a little bit of a Google on it yourself. But now that we have a really fundamental understanding of what fusion is, let's talk about Lockheed's patent that was first filed in 2014 and awarded in 2018. 
Now, it was filed under the unassuming name of encapsulating magnetic fields for plasma confinement. The fusion device it describes would use superconductors to produce a magnetic field that can house superheated plasma within the confines of its reaction chamber 2,000 times better than any existing fusion system, at least according to them. It serves as the backbone of the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works Compact Fusion Reactor, or CFR program. According to their patent paperwork, this really efficient design allows for smaller fusion reactors than ever previously thought possible. And that small size allows for not only expedited development, but also a much broader range of potential applications. Now, the patent comes with a 26-page document explaining all of this, and I quote it pretty heavily throughout my full write-up on this topic, but for the sake of time, and because a lot of these quotes are pretty clunky, I'm going to summarize them as we move through. But if you're interested in this specific language, I highly recommend reading the patent or the article after you watch this video. Now, this is going to seem really complex, but all you really need to worry about are the numbers. The ratio of plasma volume contained within a fusion reactor to the magnetic energy density within it is known within fusion circles as the beta limit. Basically, fusion power output increases with pressure, but that magnetic field costs money to produce. It takes resources. So the amount of plasma that you can keep inside that reactor housed within the magnetic field that you can produce is really the limiting factor for fusion power production. The beta limit dictates the amount of power you can produce. Most systems today have a beta limit of between 0.01 and 0.05, or between 1 and 5%. In fact, a 5% system is considered pretty efficient. The system laid out in the Skunk Works patent, on the other hand, is expected to offer a beta limit of 1. As in, not 1%, but 100%. This time, I will quote Dr. Thomas McGuire, the head of the Skunk Works Compact Fusion Project. The system is therefore regulated by a self-tuning feedback mechanism, whereby the farther out the plasma goes, the stronger the magnetic field pushes back to contain it. According to the Skunk Works, a single reactor using their confinement system could run continuously for a year on just 25 pounds of fuel, all while producing roughly 100 megawatts of power. That's enough to power the homes of 100,000 people. Potential applications for this kind of device are staggering, and the Skunk Works patent includes pretty obvious ones, like powering an aircraft carrier, as well as more novel ones, like containerized fusion trucks to provide emergency electricity to cities after natural disasters. But it'll come as no surprise to you that the part of the patent that really caught my eye was a reactor made small enough to be housed within the fuselage of an F-16. In order to understand how nuclear fusion could power an aircraft's propulsion, it would really first help to understand how turbofans and turbojets work to begin with. But again, we're talking about an exacting science here, so please bear with me while I give you a pretty simplistic summary. Modern turbojet engines, or jet engines as we tend to call them, suck in air from the front of the engine and compress it until it's usually between 3 and 12 times the density that it started out as. Fuel is then added to the compressed air and ignited. That newly ignited air-fuel mixture usually hits temperatures of around 1100 to 1300 degrees Fahrenheit as it passes through a turbine, which drives the compressor that squished the air to begin with on its way out of a nozzle to produce thrust. Turbofan engines, like those you'd find on a commercial airliner or some sorts of bombers, work with a pretty similar premise. But incoming air is split into two different flows. One passes through the fan and continues into the compressor to follow that same process. The rest of the airflow bypasses that internal engine and simply passes through the propeller, slightly increasing its velocity and adding a bit more thrust as it goes through. 
According to the Lockheed patent, the combustor found in those turbojet and turbofan engines could be replaced by a heat exchanger plumbed to the fusion reactor. Superheated coolant would flow out of the fusion reactor, through a fuel processor, through an auxiliary power unit, and into the engine, where it would heat the air the same way combustion would without the need for fuel. It would then flow back through the APU, the fuel processing unit, and back to the reactor to do the whole thing again. This could mean aircraft going their entire service lives without ever needing to refuel. And while that might just sound convenient to those of you who think of refueling in terms of stopping at the gas station, the truth is it would be a way bigger deal than that. Today, the Air Force alone operates 490 refueling tankers, and they're absolutely vital to national security. Most of America's fighters only have enough fuel to stay on station for about 30 minutes once they get to the fight. After that, they need to either head home or head for a tanker. Long-duration bombing missions are absolutely reliant on meeting tankers at precise points along their flight paths. Tankers themselves, though, are pretty vulnerable aircraft, and in a fight against a near pier, with advanced air defenses and significant air power to draw from, it would invariably mean losing a lot of these gas stations in the sky. Most years, the Air Force burns through around 2 billion gallons of aviation fuel. Fusion could literally drop that to near zero, all while giving fighters, bombers, drones, and other platforms practically limitless range and loiter time. And because fusion reactors don't function anything like fission weapon systems, captured or recovered reactors from downed aircraft would pose very little risk of either environmental contamination or giving the bad guy a chance to reverse engineer nuclear weapons technology out of it. But the truth is, flying without fuel is really just the beginning of what fusion could do for aviation. An abundance of electrical energy could power an array of advanced directed energy weapons, as well as groundbreaking new missile defense systems like the Navy's patented laser-induced plasma filament holograms, which literally project superheated illusions of another aircraft dozens of meters from the jet itself to confuse incoming infrared-guided weapons. But even that is still thinking small. Pretty much every facet of current aircraft design and operation is affected by the need to carry, manage, or efficiently use liquid fuel. From internal space allocation to external shape, from engine management to combat tactics, all of this, and I do mean all of this, could change if Lockheed Martin's containerized fusion concept ever comes to fruition. But by now, I can hear some of you screaming about the mind-bogglingly broad implications of fusion power, and what a travesty it is to think of it strictly in terms of weapon applications, like fighters or bombers. But the truth is, there's a good reason for us to think that this technology will find its way into the fight before it finds its way into our homes. The fact of the matter is, burning oil for energy may not be good for the environment, but it's still a lot cheaper than developing a new means of power production and whole new fleets of vehicles to leverage it. While reducing oil consumption has really clear benefits in terms of the environment, it's unlikely that humanity will actually run out of it anytime soon. According to BP's statistical review of world energy, there's at least another 48 years worth of oil at 2019 usage levels in our known and existing oil reserves, using the infrastructure that's already local to them. But scientists are well aware that there's a great deal more oil still out there, either undiscovered or being stored in places that the local infrastructure can't easily access. The painful truth is that there's still a lot of oil on this earth, and it's pretty cheap to leverage. And this all brings me to the UK's Atomic Energy Authority's CEO, a man named Professor Ian Chapman, who was recently asked how long he thinks it would be before fusion became commercially viable. In response, he likened fusion to the space race. He said that in 1962, Kennedy's speech saying America would go to the moon seemed downright ludicrous, but by allocating 4% of America's GDP to the effort for the rest of the decade, they made it happen. Fusion may run on hydrogen isotopes, but to get it started, you've got to burn a big wad of money.
So, while fusion may be a game changer for literally the whole planet, practical use for it may just manifest first in the shadowy confines of an Area 51 hangar, or an exotic submarine propulsion program, or some other Pentagon initiative. Ironically enough, a reliable, efficient, and safe means of producing huge surpluses of power could lead to a reduction in conflict for the rest of human history, meaning that on a long enough timeline, the DoD may just spend itself right out of the job. If you ask me, that's an outcome we can all hope for. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.